Gendered Innovations, Harnessing the Power of Gender Analysis to Make New Discoveries. I'm Londa Schiebinger. What happens when you bring together 60 scientists, engineers, and gender experts in a series of international collaborative workshops? You get something radically new. That's what we did with Gendered Innovations. Thanks to support from the European Commission, the U.S. National Science Foundation, and Stanford University, Gendered Innovations brought together 60 natural scientists, engineers, and gender experts in a series of collaborative workshops that drew talent from across the U.S., Europe, and Canada. And now we've expanded to Asia. Today, I'd like to explore gendered innovations with you. The operative question is, how do we harness the creative power of sex and gender analysis to discover new things? Gendered innovations provide the tools to integrate sex and gender analysis into research. But first, a bit of background. Governments and universities have taken three strategic approaches to gender equality over the past several decades. First, fix the numbers of women. This focuses on increasing women's participation in science. Second, fix the institutions promotes gender equality in careers through structural change in research organizations. And third, Fix the Knowledge or Gendered Innovations stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex and gender analysis into research. Gendered Innovations focuses on this third strategic approach. It's the newest and hottest area and the most important for the future of science, engineering, and innovation. Data show that gender bias built into society and research institutions creates gender bias in science and technology. Gender bias in research is expensive in terms of lives and costs and limits scientific creativity, excellence, and benefits to society. For example, 10 drugs were recently withdrawn from the U.S. market because of life-threatening health effects. Eight of those posed greater threats for women. Not only did these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause death and human suffering. We simply can't afford to get it wrong. It's crucially important to identify gender bias in science and technology, but analysis can't stop there. We need to turn it around we need to get it right from the beginning. We need to harness the creative power of gender analysis to discover new things. This is the goal of gendered innovations. This project develops state-of-the-art methods of sex and gender analysis and provides case studies to illustrate how gender analysis leads to innovative science and technology. Let me give you a few quick examples of gendered innovations from different areas of science and technology. These are just a few of the aha moments from our gendered innovation workshops. Our first example comes from cells and tissues and looks specifically at stem cell therapies. Let's go back to why 10 drugs were withdrawn from the market. These days, developing a drug costs billions of dollars. There are many reasons why drugs fail, and fail more often for women. One reason is that research is done in males, whether human, animal, or cells and tissues. This study was done in 2011 by some of our colleagues at Berkeley. It shows the sex of animals used in research. The blue shows that males are used more than female in all areas except reproduction. But what I'm interested in is the gray area where the sex of the animal is not recorded. This is research money wasted. You might as well throw it out the window. A similar study was done at Mayo Clinic, also in 2011. And look at the gray area. The sex of the cell is almost never reported. Again, this is research money wasted. Let's look at stem cells. And now I'm going to our website so you can begin to see how it works. We have case studies here, and I find stem cells under 
science. Why might the sex of the cell be relevant? Research shows that there are sex differences in the therapeutic capacity of stem cells. And here we see cells of, from muscle tissue, and we can see that the female cells are more generative or active than the male cells. Yet very few researchers consider the sex of the cell. Not considering the sex of the cell can lead to failed research. An international research team from Norway and Australia worked with stem cells in mice. They appropriately used male and female mice, already an excellent research design, but they used all female stem cells. This is an unconscious decision that does not reflect best scientific practice. The result was that all of their male mice died and they didn't know why. They thought maybe the postdoc was to blame. Eventually, through a gendered innovations workshop in Norway, the team realized they should also consider the sex of the stem cells. They found that matching the donor and the recipient, or considering what that match would be, led to the best science. So here we see the sex of the donor and the sex of the recipient, and you have to consider all of the possible matches before ruling any out. They found that sex matching of donor and recipient yielded the best results, so male to male and female to female. But all combinations should be tested before being ruled out. And the research can't stop there. Other variables, such as stem cell type, are important, the disease being treated, the hormonal and environmental factors, all of these interact with sex to impact outcomes. Now we have many methods. Our website has case studies in these buckets of topics, and then we have methods, and you need to look at the methods carefully. For this case study, analyzing sex is the important method. I won't go into that now, but you, you certainly can. Now let me move to my next example, which comes from engineering and specifically from computer science, and we're going to look at machine translation. I start with the story. A couple of years ago, I was in Madrid and interviewed by some Spanish newspapers. When I returned home, I zoomed the articles through Google Translate and was shocked that I was referred to repeatedly as he. Londa Schiebinger, he says he wrote, he thought. Google Translate has a male default. How can such a cool company as Google make such a fundamental error? Google Translate defaults to the male pronoun because he said occurs more often on the World Wide Web than she said. And here's the interesting part. We know from Ngram, another Google product, that the ratio of he said to she said has fallen dramatically from a peak of 4.1 in the 1960s to 2 to 1 since 2000. This parallels exactly the women's movement and robust governmental funding to increase the number of women in science. With one algorithm, Google wiped out 40 years of revolution in language, and they didn't mean to. This is unconscious gender bias. The fix? A couple of years ago, the Gendered Innovations Project held a workshop where we invited two natural language processing experts, one from Stanford and one from Google. They listened for about 20 minutes, they got it, and they said, we can fix that. While the fix is complicated, the search for solutions is on. Once they got it, we got an innovation. Fixing is great, but constantly retrofitting for women is not the best road forward. A deeper fix would be to integrate gender studies into the engineering curriculum at places like Stanford University so that Google engineers don't make such an error in the future. 
My next innovation takes us to Sub-Saharan Africa and water infrastructure. So now I'm going to environment and to water infrastructure. Nearly one billion people worldwide lack reliable access to water. In Sub-Saharan Africa, women and girls spend 40 billion hours annually carrying water. Here the gendered innovation is tapping into this local knowledge. Because carrying water is women's work, many women have detailed knowledge of the soils and water they yield, knowledge that is vital to civil engineers when placing wells and water taps. Here we see a woman in Ghana mapping well sites. Such community participation vastly improves water services. And here we get a win-win. When girls aren't carrying water, they tend to go to school and potentially break out of the cycle of poverty. My final example of an innovation here comes again from engineering, and I'm going to look at assistive technologies for the elderly. The world population will age dramatically by 2050, as we see on this chart. This is a problem for Europe, for the US, and also for Japan. Large elderly populations will place a growing strain on human caregivers, health, and social systems. This case study explores markets for assistive technologies for the elderly and looks at the value added of considering both sex and gender when designing these technologies. Assistive technologies support independent living for the elderly. When developing these technologies, it's important to look at the sex-related physical needs of men and women. Women, for example, tend to live longer, but may have more debilitating disease. Men, for example, tend to lose their hearing earlier. In addition to looking at sex differences, it's also important to look at gender differences. As they age, women and men have different partnering patterns. They have different experience in household management and different receptivity to technology. Elderly women, for example, more often live alone. And here, our engineering checklist, which you find up here, uh, encourages researchers to analyze how sex and gender interact in individual women and men so that research can design the most effective and marketable assistive technologies. Designers want their products to be useful and appealing to both men and women. Gender becomes an issue as assistive technologies become more personalized. And we know that a lot of assistive robots are now being made. One of these is, is a robotic nurse named Cody that can bathe elderly people. Bathing will involve a very intimate relationship between human and machine. And designers need to get the gender of the machine right. Another assistive robot is Herb, home exploring robot butler, who can fetch household items for you. Herb can fetch you a cup of tea. He can remind you to take your medicine and even to clean up the kitchen. If there is a robot to clean up the kitchen, I'm ordering it immediately. As these robots enter our lives, we humans will gender them. Studies of machine voices, synthetic voices, I'm talking about machine-generated voices, show that human listeners assign gender to machine voices. That is to say, we interpret these machine voices as the voice of a man or a woman, even when the designer may have tried to create a gender-neutral voice. Apple's Siri, the original iPhone voice, is interesting in this regard. Ask Siri why she is a woman. I do this sometimes as a party game. One of her responses is, I was not assigned a gender, implying that it's not Apple's fault that you, the listener, ascribe gender to her. As soon as humans interpret a voice as masculine or feminine, 
we tend to apply all of our cultural stereotypes to the machine. Considering sex and gender when designing new assistive technologies will be one important factor to ensure that the products are successful with all users. There are many gendered innovations we could discuss. Through the Gendered Innovation Project, we developed 23 case studies that you can see here in this area. These case studies range from uh, the subfields of science and engineering, from the design of video games, to osteoporosis research in men, to, and to climate change, just to name a few. Designing sex and gender analysis into research and innovation is one crucial component contributing to world-class science and technology. As our case studies demonstrate, integrating sex and gender analysis into research enhances excellence and sparks creativity in research. Sex and gender analysis adds value to society by making research more responsive to a broad number of diverse users. The next step is to bring the current generation of researchers up to speed in gender analysis. We might do this through five interrelated policies. Now let me ask you, by show of hand, how many of you work with granting agencies? Granting agencies such as the NSF or NIH can ask applicants to explain how sex and gender analysis is relevant to their proposed research. Several granting agencies have developed innovative policies in this area. For example, the European Commission has made this an important part of Horizon 2020, their next funding framework. Also, since 2010, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research requires all applicants to consider the sex and gender in their research. And since 2008, the Gates Foundation requires applicants to consider gender in agricultural research. Now second, how many of you are on hiring and promotion committees? Hiring and promotion committees can evaluate researchers and educators on their success in implementing gendered innovations. This can be one factor taken into consideration. Third, how many of you are on editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals? Editorial boards of peer-reviewed journals can require sophisticated sex and gender analysis when selecting papers for publication. A number of journals do this. Nature, for example, has a limited policy. Fourth, how many of you work in industry? Industry can incorporate the smartest aspects of gender to open new markets and enable innovation in products, processes, services, or infrastructures. Products that meet the needs of complex and diverse user groups enhance global competitiveness and sustainability. And finally, how many of you are professors? How many of you teach? Professors from elementary school to high school and graduate school can integrate the results of gendered innovations into the curriculum. It's crucial to train the next generation. Innovation is what makes the world tick. As I hope I've begun to show, gendered innovation sparks creativity by offering new perspectives, posing new questions, and opening new areas to research. Can we afford to ignore such opportunities?